Welcome to this, you can see on the, on the uh, flyer, it says the Wolf Institute, and below here it says, a Frederick Ewan Conference in Civil Liberties and Academic Freedom. Uh, in 1953, uh, during the height of the McCarthy hysteria, when uh, the senator from the junior senator from Wisconsin was going around saying he had a list of 250 or whatever it was communists who were all working in the State Department, and he was going to release the list at any moment. Of course, it never appeared. But he created an absolute mass paranoia in this country, and lots of people lost their jobs. And one of them was Professor Frederick Ewan, who, who taught in the English department here. Uh, many years later, 1987, I think it was, we had a conference about McCarthyism. And it was a two-day conference. And it included a, a complete half day on McCarthyism at Brooklyn College, because a lot of people lost their jobs. Um, A couple of days later, Fred Ewan, Frederick, Fred Ewan was there, by the way. He was 87 years old. And um, he spoke about what had happened to him, and he was very eloquent. A couple of days later, we got a letter from his nephew, who had been a student here when Fred was a professor. And his nephew had become a very wealthy uh, insurance company owner. And he gave us a pot of money to use in order to endow a series in the, in the name of his uncle on academic freedom and civil liberties. And I remember when we got the money, I thought, how are we ever going to find something to do on this same subject every semester? Now, that was a long time ago, 1988. And we have never had any trouble finding a subject. Because in fact, um, it turns out that the notion of academic freedom and the notion of freedom of speech and of thought are pretty much always under attack by somebody, and usually by lots of people. Um, it's difficult for us to uh, bear that other people have opinions different from our own on consequential subjects. And you know, the newspapers are filled with people getting enraged at people who have a religion that they don't like, or opinions that they don't like, or wear clothes that they don't like, or do many, many kinds of things that they don't like. Um, how we are to deal with this is always a conundrum. And for that reason, it has been enormously useful to us here to have people who are studying attacks on civil liberties. And there are plenty of such people. And one of them is today's speaker. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not here to introduce her. I'm uh, just here to tell you what the series is. And uh, of all of the things that we have at the Wolf Institute, and we have lots of different kinds of programs, of lectures and conferences and things, this is the one that I'm proudest of. Um, and I would like now to introduce to you uh, Professor Mustafa Bayoumi, who uh, knows a good deal about this subject himself. And he teaches in the English department here, and he is a distinguished author who talks a great deal about the paradoxes of freedom uh, in this country. Mustafa. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I won't take up much of your time because there's uh, much to see instead. But I do want to uh, introduce to you Lyric R. Cabral, who is here today. We are very lucky to have her here today, um, who has made this extraordinary documentary. Um, that if you haven't, um, if you're not familiar with it, it's even better because you'll just you get thrown right into a, a world um, that's illuminating. Uh, it's uh, one of the things that I don't want to direct your, your uh, viewing of the documentary, but I do want to suggest that you consider the relationship be essentially between poverty and the war on terror, which I think is really uh, an unexamined un subject and one that is really at, at the core of 
several of the questions that the, f the uh, documentary itself raises. Um, this is uh, Lyric's first full-length documentary, if I'm not mistaken, and um, she also went for a time at uh, to Brooklyn College. Uh, so, th in a few years, it'll be you sitting where she's sitting right now, and uh, and pr presenting your documentaries here. Um, she's an extraordinarily accomplished filmmaker who is now working on another film called The Rashomon Effect. You can have the full biography you'll see in the. Uh, in the pamphlet here, but the next film, The Rashomon Effect, will shed new light on the shooting of Michael Brown by former Ferguson police officer Darren Wilson. And I'm eager to see that because I'm so convinced that the, of the quality of this film that I'm uh, really uh, excited about when knowing what's going to happen with the next. Uh, so maybe Lyric can introduce the, uh, the film herself. Thank you. Um, it's such a pleasure to be back to Brook at Brooklyn College, especially being introduced by Mustafa. Um, I read his book, How to Be a Pro How Does It Feel to Be a Problem, when I was a student here, and it was very illuminating. Um, it really shaped my journalism in the sense that I started telling Muslim American stories. I realized that after 9-11, there was a dearth of, of reporting on really stories that answered who are Muslims, right? What do, what do they do? What do the communities look like in an honest way? I heard a lot of sensationalized stories, but not really honest stories, and so that book was sort of my introduction to honest storytelling about people who happen to be Muslim. And so I'm sure we all heard the news this morning when we woke up um, about a terrorist attack in Brussels, right? So that is sort of everyone's worst fear. Um, a, you know, multiple bombs going off in the heart of a city causing immense tragedy. Um, but this film is looking at the FBI's efforts to protect against that sort of attack in the United States. Um, and we rarely get to see how the FBI goes about sort of investigating counterterrorism, um, and that's what this film gives an opportunity to do, and so that's all I'll say. So given the framework of what happened this morning and sort of what you see in the film about how we try to stop those attacks, I would love to have a discussion afterwards um, about how civil liberties are impacted. Um, so something that's unfortunate about terrorism cases is because they're federal, um, so is our housing system when you get sort of um, when you're low income and are dealing with um, housing vouchers. And so Khalifa actually lived in public housing and he and his wife were married Islamically but not per the laws of our country, so to speak. And because that official marriage hadn't happened, it was sort of in progress, um, she was kicked out because she was not a resident. She was not his legal wife. And so on the day of his arrest, um, like literally within hours after he was arrested, the FBI went back to the apartment to sort of finish categorizing evidence, and they kicked her out. They, they sort of talked to the management because it was a federal housing. Yeah, so she actually, um, so after they kicked her out, um, again, she was from Somalia. She, um, by way of the UK, so she was a Somali immigrant. Um, Khalifa met her in the UK, brought her over here legally. They were planning to get married. Um, but because again, sort of she was, she had no family here. And so it was a very sad situation. That's what Khalifa was concerned about. So no family, no friends. And she was dependent on the Muslim community, largely in Pittsburgh to like help her out. But Khalifa um, had a very contested relationship with the Muslim community. And so she was pretty much like bouncing house to house, um, trying to receive support. And ultimately the government told her that she had to leave um, because she was here illegally, because she was not married to a resident or anything of that nature. So she wasn't, I mean, I guess the word is not deported because she didn't, they didn't compel her to leave, but immigration took her passport. So Khalifa, she and Khalifa had a daughter together, one years old American citizen. So despite that child being a citizen, they took both of their passports and told Hebo she could not get her passport back until she left, like had a flight. So she had to show proof that she and her child were leaving the country before she could get her only ID back. And so she's in the UK. Um, and you know they've been working with attorneys, but it seems that she cannot come out, come back over here, or even apply to do so until Khalifa comes out of jail. And they get married. She is in the UK. Yeah, she's a UK citizen and she has family there. But yeah, it's just a, she can't come back here. And her daughter is from here, yeah. I mean, a lot of, um, since this movie has come out, sort of, there has been a lot of reporting in the press from sort of the New York Times, we were on This American Life, um, BBC, this film has been on, we're on in PBS Independent Lens now. So there has been a lot of outcry um, around this situation, but legally there's not much that can be done um, for Khalifa, because he did take a plea, 
Um, it was based on a photo that he put on Facebook. Um, the evidence was sort of indisputable in a way, unfortunately, even though he wasn't charged with the crime of terrorism, um, he was charged with holding a gun, which he put on Facebook himself. And so, you know, the outcry, legally there's not much to be done. Going back to sort of the original email that he sent, um, once he gets out of prison, he might be able to sue the FBI for like civil rights violations, for the fact that he was unfairly targeted, the fact that he was unconstitutionally surveilled based on his religion, but, mm -hmm. but so I mean, that's all that attorneys have come up with from the film is that maybe it can be a document for him of civil rights abuses. Um, that's a legal process, it's not guaranteed. I mean, that's what they say. But. Um, you know, if I am not sure, because Felipe was not charged with a crime of terrorism, his travel will probably, he'll be able to, but usually when people are charged with a crime of terrorism, um, when they come out of jail, their reentry is very um, sort of stigmatized. There are housing restrictions, there's like, travel restrictions. Um, even Tariq Shah, who was a musician, um, at the time that he met Saeed, he owed child support. So what the government had done is they took away his passport. And so because Tariq Shah was a musician, he made most of his money through like international travel and playing jazz abroad. And so when the government took away that passport, they sort of restricted his ability to make money. And then step two is when he was in the United States, you know, he was trying to go around New York City and play the tri-state area and play wherever he can get with, you know, local transportation. Um, they took away his driver's license because of child support. So the government, you know, it was the government sort of orchestrating this scenario where he was increasingly desperate. And so that's often um, what these informants' role is, in addition to sort of investigating crimes. I found that they're sort of high, um, creating conditions of desperation. Like, so the informant is always the one who will offer, if you're impoverished, to go out and eat. The informant is who will give you the ride to the mosque. So when it's snowing and you're hungry, you know, you're, you only have one person to call in a weird way. And the FBI is already targeting people who are sort of on the fringes. So Khalifa is somebody who is unemployed. You know, he, he lives in a predominantly black area. Wilkinsburg is sort of a low income urban area in Pittsburgh. So he already stood out by being one of few white people in the neighborhood, compounded by the fact that he chose to wear Islamic dress. And so all of these factors the FBI knew when they began investigating him. So that translated into in his housing complex, Khalifa had no friends, he had no allies. If you notice that day when he was arrested, nobody came out, not even one soul to like look at what was going on. There was one person in the window who quickly moved. You know, so this, the FBI knew all of these things and they often use informants to insert themselves in the lives of people who are mentally ill, who sort of are, have, do not lack, who lack like strong familial or community ties, people who are largely vulnerable. And often um, these are, predominantly Muslim young men, increasingly women are being targeted, but between the ages of 18 and 35, who are, you know, have not quite found their position in life, who are, who the FBI views as being susceptible to um, counsel. If you look at these informants, you know, Saeed is 63, Muhammad is in his 50s, so, you know, why are older men inserting themselves into the lives of younger men? The FBI will say, you know, it's to build rapport, it's so that these men can be looked up to. You know, if you're a young person questioning and you see an older man who's had a lot more life experience than you, who has been in these movements, who can speak confidently about a certain history, um, that there is some, a bit of enticement here. And where it gets a little nefarious is these people often purport to have Islamic knowledge, which they don't have. You know, so if you listen to how Saeed normally talks, no mention of Arabic. But if you listen to the message that he left on Khalifa, Khalifa's voicemail, he sounds very studied and learned. You know, so it's a different, it's sort of using Islam. Islam itself has been criminalized by the FBI. And so it's been weaponized by these informants to sort of insert views of Islam that are politicized and incorrect, that are not really reflected in the Quran. But these informants have been trained to do these things. And it's unfortunate because they go in mosque where, you know, in pursuit of Khalifa, if you look at sort of that surveillance footage in the mosque, in pursuit of one person, the whole community is opened up to surveillance sort of blanketly. Um, at the beginning of the film, you mentioned that the FBI didn't know that you were talking with Saeed. Uh, do you, did you encounter like, any, uh, any trouble in the way of creating the documentary or even after you came here? Um, well, well, that's actually, we, we can't really say that the FBI didn't know. We think they didn't know, but they've never actually given us comment. So that would have to come from that. You know, so it's a little, 
but to our understanding, they didn't, we, know, we don't think they knew because we were there for all of these things and got all this sort of intelligence that presumably if they knew, we wouldn't have been doing that. Um, but it's sort of a little premature to answer um, what has happened. Nothing, nothing per se, but you know, FBI surveillance last years. So I'm sure my co-director and myself are under active surveillance. You know, I, I use digital communication in a way that protects myself and my sources because I still engage in, you know, reporting on this type of subject matter. Um, but you know, we've been on public television. I think sort of having this film um, be viewable by the most eyes is very protective to, to myself and to my co-director. Um, the most that's happened is, so the FBI has 53 field offices across the United States, and when we premiered at Sundance, one of them was in Salt Lake City, Utah, and we had a feeling that agents might come. Um, they never announced themselves there, but later they called our sales agent, who was like responsible for selling our film, and asked for a copy, and, they, and we, like, our lawyers were like, no, wait till it's on PBS. So we told the FBI that, and their response was, well, we saw it at Sundance. And you know, we would love a copy to better educate our counterterrorism sting operations. And so, you know, so, and it happened again at Tribeca. We um, screened here last year during the Tribeca Film Festival, and there were two agents in the audience. One was black, one was white. My co-director's white. And it was weird, because after they, they kind of had law enforcement builds. And after like the screening, in a moment like this, they both kind of, like the white one went toward David, the black one went toward me. And so when, the, when he like, you know, it was kind of weird, but I finally spoke to him and he said, you know, I'm a veteran counterterrorism agent. I, I work with the FBI now. Um, I thank you for making the film. And I was like, well, what'd you think about it? He just said it was educational. And my question was, are you being paid to be here? He was like, absolutely not. So the, like, you know, there've been very limited interactions and the FBI has not really formally commented. Um, they told recently when we were in the New York Times Magazine, that's like the most forthcoming the FBI has been. Uh, a spokeswoman from the FBI's New York office said that we are in the business, we're in the business of um, protecting the identities of those whom we work with, even if they choose not to do so. So that's the closest they've sort of, but, but Saeed, um, he has relocated from both of the locations that are pictured in the film. Um, he, he's sort of going through his own internal paranoia right now. Like that's partially guilt laden, but you know, the most recent report from a few days ago is like, I'm in this new place. I feel like every time I go out, people are looking at me. So that, that's sort of the update as far as, yeah. But he has not been in contact with the FBI and he, he thinks it's over. Like he, you know, clearly he was jaded a year after this case. When he got that call, he honestly thought he would go, but yeah, now he's sort of coming to the realization that it's, it's pretty much over because no one's returning his calls. Um, so I think from a civil liberties perspective, when you say what does it do, sort of arresting these Muslim men who have no affiliations with terrorism. Um, terrorism is big business since 9-11. Like I can speak to it, I, went to, I was a student here and I was like studying journalism and I was figuring out what I should cover. Um, you know, I, I realized terrorism was a, was a big beat, right? So similarly, um, a lot of people speak on the terrorism industrial complex, like all the, think of all the people, the court officers, sort of the people that the FBI has to employ in pursuit of terrorist threats. And also on the political level, we're like in an election year, and if you look at how ISIS is always in the media, it's very rare that a politician will not take a pro-fighting terrorism stance or will question any of these sort of cases. So when you say, what does it accomplish? Um, I think it fuels the terrorism industrial complex. It gives us cases to announce on the news. Collectively, it makes us feel safer because we think we have sort of discovered threats in the homeland because the media is always promoting there are abundant threats worldwide and here. Um, but I think if you, you know, the, the impact has been on Muslim American communities, largely. That, that's who, I mean, even here at Brooklyn College, there's been reporting that indicated that the Muslim Student Association was sent informants by the NYPD. There's a former student in Brooklyn College that's in a supermax prison right now based on suspected terrorism activity. You know, so all, it's very real. Um, but to your point, what does it accomplish? I guess we're, you know, sort of all these years out from 9-11, we're still trying to figure that out. The Muslim American community will say, 
and a lot of civil liberties advocates are saying that these type of prosecutions are actually not making us safer because it's sort of restricting dialogue in Muslim communities. It's sort of, these are not, you know, sort of spaces like MSAs, which should be active centers for sort of ideological discussions and current events. All of these sort of ideas are being restricted. People are not feeling comfortable speaking in these spaces because you never know who's next to you. And the same thing is happening sort of in religious communities and hookah bars and you know, any spaces that are associated with Muslims or sort of Arabs, unfortunately, in New York City. So what is it doing? You know, it's not really benefiting us. It's also creating, um, among certain percentages of the population, a bit of animus toward our government. Like, why would I help to police my own community if you're always looking at me as a threat? You know, so it's actually sort of, um, it's detrimental to our collective public safety, these type of operations, in my opinion because there are real terrorists, look at Brussels, right? But those individuals, real terrorists are sort of g genuinely under the radar for the most part, you know, and it takes hard investigative skills to find these people, but these types of people like Khalifa are very accessible. You'll find someone who's misguided and impoverished and susceptible to like conversation anywhere, it, but it's a lot harder to find the terrorists, you know? So I think these, this is like low hanging fruit for our government that they can claim as like easy victories and those victories translate into continue, continue funding for police departments and the FBI and sort of our judicial officials. So it's a whole system that these prosecutions are sort of fueling. Oh, sorry. It's on, um, for, it's like 48 hours more on Independent Lens's website. So if you just Google Terror Independent Lens, it's, yeah, the whole movie's on there. And it's a shorter version than this, like about 20 minutes less. Well, um, if you just listen to Saeed's personal story, um, what the government often says is it takes a criminal to find a criminal, right? So it, this is an old strategy that was used with like mob investigations. The FBI will often think, how can I break into a network but for a member on the inside, right? So that's sort of a interesting way of thinking, but if you look at Saeed's history, he was a criminal and he got arrested on a federal crime. And so it's a, like, it's a part of our, social, of our justice system, even if you get arrested on a minor offense, first time charged, they will always encourage you to tell. Meaning like, can you provide information? If, whether it's like a bag of weed, who did you get it from? You know, so there's always, there's an element of our criminal justice system that encourages you to trade information in exchange for leniency, right? And so with, in Saeed's case, he was robbing um, MTA token booths and he had been doing so for 11 years. And, you know, they were like, who was doing this? It was like a series of inside robberies. So when he finally got caught, it was a federal crime. And federal agents instantly asked him, you know, what, what more information do you know? And because the World Trade Center attack, the first one had already happened, there was sort of internally a sense of a burgeoning Islamic threat. And as you see from the movie, Saeed had a connection to this mosque in Brooklyn. And so when they asked him sort of about this robbery crime, he, being the sort of opportunist that he is, mentioned that he had this Islamic connection. And so, you know, they presented the opportunity and he did not decline, right? But in other ways that, so since 9-11, um, there's been a program targeting Muslim immigrants, meaning anyone who is sort of here on a visa, people who have overstayed their visa. Um, there's been programs targeting taxi drivers. So, you know, basically there's blanket surveillance of sort of large portions of the Muslim community. And once those names are checked, if there's a slight, you know, if there's not an I dotted or a T cross, often those people are targeted by, by the FBI, right? They'll show up at their door. These, imagine if your visa, you've overstayed by three days, you see three FBI agents and they ask you, you know, I know you go to this mosque. All I need you to do is go on Friday, get some license plates, and you might be able to get a visa for somebody who's still at home. You know, so there's a lot of ways that the FBI pressures people to become informants because I particularly don't think people volunteer. Arguably, these are like foot soldiers in the war on terror. You're arguably supposed to be interacting with dangerous people, terrorists, people who can sort of cause mass chaos. And so, you know, nobody really wants to volunteer for that, especially against your own community. You know, it takes a certain type of personality. And so often people are pressured by the FBI through immigration status, through previous criminal history, things like that. 
Oh, and actually, I would say too that um, something that came up in the film, um, people are targeted based on sometimes what they study in school, right? So. Said, I mean, there was another person in the case that ultimately fell through, but he was a student at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. And when we asked, he was a friend of Khalifa's who dressed the same way as him. So simply because the FBI was monitoring Khalifa, they saw him interacting frequently with this, he was African American, he simply dressed the same way. And when they looked into him, why he became a further person of interest is because he was an engineering student at Carnegie Mellon. So because he was Muslim, dressed this way, was friends with someone who was suspected by the FBI and studied engineering, all of the above, and he was, a, he was active in the MSA leadership. And so all of these things sort of put him under suspicion. You know, not, not because of any warranted reason, but these are sort of causes. No, no, no. Uh, I don't know if this has been asked. Actually, I went, I went to a meeting many, many years ago with the Muslim community and the FBI, and where one of the FBI uh, agents actually sat at the meeting, we are investigating the Muslim community the way we investigated the Koza Nostra. So, and <laughs> exactly, he actually like, straight out said it that way. And the way that they investigate too was also these sort of, they see them as familial relationships. So, so anybody who has any kind of passing contact, that doesn't surprise me that what you just said, gets caught up in the web of everything. But I was gonna, I just wanted to ask you um, also if, if um, you can make a, what do you think the, the similarities and the differences are with things like COINTELPRO and the current environment? Right, um, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with COINTELPRO, it was lightly touched on um, in the archive sections of like the Black Panther Party. But under J. Edgar Hoover, um, COINTELPRO was a program where in the FBI, which is supposed to really investigate domestic threats, was used for political purposes to target like the American Indian movement the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, um, the Weather Underground, basically all these political organizations that were deemed a threat to like the current American um, political status quo. So these are people that were trying to, in various ways, not overthrow the government, but definitely they were encouraging revolution, right? And so the FBI um, sort of was tasked under this COINTELPRO program with infiltrating and disrupting all of these organizations. And in the Black Panther Party, um, cause just because that's the one I'm most familiar with, they, you know, it went as deep as they like fabricated coloring books and gave them to kids. And the coloring books advocated killing police officers and they said Black Panther Party on the front, but they were created by the FBI. Um, you know, that they hired African American informants specifically to go into Vietnam vets who were, again, talking about how informants get recruited. These were people who came back from Vietnam, some of them drug addicted, most of them coming into poverty, into sort of situation where there's civil rights struggles, and the FBI intentionally included those black people to sort of become members of the Black Panther Party and infiltrate the groups. And so a lot of people are comparing sort of the FBI's political activities in the Muslim community in the name of surveillance now to COINTELPRO, meaning like the Muslim community has been otherized by our government, by the FBI. Um, if you look at sort of counterterrorism training materials, um, they're very um, Islamophobic. They're very, um, Islam itself has been criminalized. If you look at sort of um, some of the factors for radicalization, it's praying frequently, you know, wearing Islamic dress. Um, you know, just very basic things that are sort of central to the fa fasting in Ramadan. Like these are very basic Islamic tenets, you know, but the fact that they're in training materials, um, it seems like there's been an institutionalized effort to criminalize Islam in the same way that in the like 60s and the 70s, the FBI was used to sort of crush this political dissent. Um, here in New York City, there was, it even went to the point of like trials. There was a big um, conspiracy case called the Panther 21. If you know Jamal Joseph, he's right now a professor at Columbia, but he, he was a, I think he was a teenager actually when he was arrested in that case. And they said that people wanted to sort of blow up buildings and the Bronx Zoo and all these things. And it was constructed by informants. And the, it ultimately fell through in a court of law but you know, these type of COINTELPRO S suggestions, like they, they really destroy people's lives. Asada Shakur is in Cuba right now because of COINTELPRO. Matulu Shakur is in jail right now because of COINTELPRO. So a lot of, um, I don't know if you guys have heard the term political prisoners. A lot of people say when people are falsely arrested or sort of because of, if people are arrested on charges, or excuse me, if people are arrested and convicted based on legitimate crimes, but sort of the underpinning is political activity. A lot of people call those individuals political prisoners. And so similarly, 
um, you know, organizations like the ACLU and the Center for Constitutional Rights, if you look at that wall of names that was in that press conference, um, a lot of people are pushing for sort of people who have been convicted under um, crimes of terrorism, but have involved the use of an informant, a lot of people are saying these are our modern day political prisoners, akin to people who were convicted under sort of COINTELPRO back in the day. And just one more thing about COINTELPRO, the government didn't admit to this program. The way COINTELPRO was found out um, is that activists broke into an FBI office at night in Media, Pennsylvania. There's a great documentary called 1971, if you wanna check it out, it's all about that. But activists broke in, you know, basically they were just trying to burn the names of people who were registered, like to be drafted, right, in the FBI office. They didn't want any more calls. They were just went in there to burn the files. And they found all these documents talking about surveillance that, that sort of looked illegal and sort of um, weird sort of activities that the FBI was engaging in. And it ultimately was COINTELPRO. So they found evidence sort of of the program. And that compelled the FBI to speak publicly and so, sort of to acknowledge that it existed and there were, you know, went all the way to Congress, um, the church, excuse me, to the Senate, the, the church committee hearings. Um, and literally that's, the, that's where we got regulation for the use of informants. That's where sort of the attorney general set guidelines for the FBI and how it could sort of operate in domestic operations. But um, it has been breaking those in the name of counterterrorism, pretty unabashedly. Um, but again, we're sort of waiting for discovery, like a lot of journalists are foyering, because um, something else that happens in terrorism cases, a lot of evidence becomes secret. That's why it was so important to us to sort of get on the ground and to get as much documentation of this case as we could, text messages from the FBI, voicemails, sort of um, immediate testimony from the informant, immediate testimony from his person of interest, because really, you know, without, a lot of journalists are sort of looking for that wormhole, right, the COINTELPRO documents of our time. Because again, it, that was many, many years after that actual FBI's illegal activities that COINTELPRO came to light. So there are a lot of people around the country sort of actively pushing against these government agencies to get information that might reveal a more standardized program, like a directive from the FBI to unconstitutionally target Muslims specifically. Uh, interesting. Like how, how would you how are we able to interview Khalifa? Um, so in the movie, as you see, so just a little note about social media, Khalifa's Facebook was, was public. Arguably, the FBI should have never had reason to convict him based on a photo because he put it online. But so as you saw, Saeed was regularly checking Khalifa's Facebook. So were we. Um, so once we knew, once Saeed told us like his Facebook name, we would check it frequently. And increasingly over the course of the investigation, Khalifa would articulate suspicions. And obviously we couldn't share them with Saeed. And the reason we couldn't, um, before I answer your question, is like we consulted with lawyers, um, you know, the ACLU in particular, and they told us this was a very important film. You know, they stood behind us wholeheartedly. But the thing for which the FBI might be able to arrest us would be tampering with an investigation, with an active counterterrorism investigation. And what that meant at the simplest terms were if the FBI could ever say, this case in Pittsburgh would have been successful but for these filmmakers. And so that meant like we had to, we couldn't tell Saeed we were filming with Khalifa and likewise we couldn't tell Khalifa we were filming with Saeed. So we were just watching Khalifa's Facebook and increasingly he would get more and more suspicious and ultimately one day he just put out that long statement, I met Saeed here in 2011, here's who he told me he was and we were reading it and we were like, oh my God, this is the moment our lawyers had told us about because like because he went public with that disclosure we could reach out to him because we weren't, would not be tampering with the investigation. And how we reached out to him, the last line of his Facebook post and email was like, I encourage journalists to come and talk to me. Because he really, want, you know, he felt in danger. He felt like the FBI was closing in, he could be arrested at any moment, he knew he was innocent, he just sort of wanted to tell his tale. And in particular, why us? Um, I had done previous reporting on the Newburgh 4 case. Um, the Newburgh Four was a terrorism trial that happened here in, in New York City in 2009. It was four um, African American men were accused of blowing up two synagogues in the Bronx and trying to shoot down a military plane in Newburgh, New York. And the informant, Muhammad, was the informant in that case. So I had done some video work of the family, I had some photographs online, and Khalifa had actually seen those. Like in his discovery and Googling Muhammad's number, he came across that journalism and that helped him to sort of put the face with the voice that he knew. 
And so because of that, you know, basically I just reached out like, you know, we really, David and I are here in Pittsburgh. We would love to talk to you. We're, we're you know, we've been reporting on Shahid Hussein. We'd love to follow up. Because that's really all we could tell him. We couldn't really give him any further context, but he really wanted to tell his story. And he emailed a lot of the likely suspects, like the Washington Post and sort of, um, well, Intercept wasn't around then, but he did. Um, I don't recall, but he emailed NPR, Trevor Aronson, this journalist who writes on informants a lot. And actually, literally, we were just the first people to get there. All these other people had made sort of meetings with him, but Khalifa was arrested three days after we started filming. So we didn't really have much time. The question. Um, I say the most prominent um, person who's, who has been punished, quote unquote, is Laura Poitras. So Laura Poitras is a filmmaker. She won the Oscar last year um, for a film called Citizen Four. It won Best Documentary, and that is a documentary about Edward Snowden. And so she was basically following Edward Snowden after he made his, he, you know, he was the whistleblower who sort of disclosed all of the sort of NSA spying, particularly on our cell phones and like internet use and like stole the PowerPoints and gave them to the public so we could actually see how the FBI and the NSA and sort of other security agencies engaged in this work. And Laura Poitras basically followed him from the sort of, in the aftermath of that disclosure, he, you know, he got kicked out of the United States, he ended up going to Moscow, he was looking for sort of a home, but to make a long story short, as a result of her, and she also, her film before the Snowden movie was a film about the bodyguard of Osama bin Laden and then the film before that was a film about the Iraq War, in which she was on the ground, sort of talking to troops, talking to sort of people who had been impacted on the Iraqi side by bombs and things like that. And so as a result of her journalism, she's been placed on the no-fly list. Every time um, when you're in an airport, um, sort of there are borderless zones, meaning if you're in an airport and you're crossing a border, um, you know, sort of the custom zone, Every time she enters one of those zones, um, you lose your rights, and so they always seized her laptop. They would prevent her from, like, they would take her phone. And so based on her journalism, these things sort of increasingly were happening to her. Um, in the middle of this, in the middle of the Snowden reporting, she also won the Pulitzer for her, um, because she put some of that journalism in the Washington Post. And those, those sort of accolades from the industry are the only things that have allowed her to get off the no-fly list. She had to get a very public sort of, um, most of the documentary filmmakers, Michael Moore, sort of the top names that you know, she got about 300 people to sign a, a letter that had to be published in like major newspapers, like please stop detaining Laura Poitras at the border, she's doing great work. You know, so that, that is sort of the most prominent story, I would say, of FBI harassment because they literally, every time she was at the border, she had a problem and she was on the no-fly list. And, and actually, while completing the film about Edward Snowden, she didn't feel comfortable staying in this country. She actually edited the whole movie in Germany, in Berlin, because they have some of the most stringent privacy laws. But I say that increasingly, you know, a lot of people are opting, a lot of Americans who engage in this type of work are opting to leave the country, just because it is a little safer, a lot of people think. No. So, because this story was very personal to me, um, Saeed was my neighbor. So, you know, I, I didn't know. I was, for four years, I was talking with him in an apartment that had cameras. I met Tariq Shah. You know, he just introduced me at, Saeed was like, hey, this is Tariq, he's teaching me the bass. And, in, you know, we were living in a, a brownstone in Harlem. I was on the top floor, Saeed was on the bottom. And so, you know, I, I literally put myself in the middle of something I had no knowledge of. One day, just like in the movie, Saeed left. And um, you know the apartment was empty, and he called me. He's like, "Lyric, I have something to tell you." And I went, like he was down south, and I went to see him. And that's when he told me he had worked for the FBI. That apartment was monitored. Um, it, it was monitored and wired because Tariq was there, and that all those cameras had been recording the same for the same time. You know, and so I was very at 19. I knew that I was under FBI surveillance, and so in a weird way, that puts me in an interesting position because I didn't go looking for this story, right? Like they actually spied on the wrong person, which I think is kind of funny. And so now, because they gave me the access or somebody, you know, I don't know how Saeed came in my life to this day, but I'm not really worried. I think, you know, for me personally, I can't do these types of stories and look for truth. And so that's hidden with like a fear that makes sense. So I don't really, I just, the, the fear that I have is not producing strong journalism that will protect me. Like if my facts are wrong, if it's not well researched, you know, these, if people view this as conspiracy theory and not actual 
documented evidence, then I think I'll have a problem. But the fear is more how can I develop the storytelling and the journalism to a point so as to present it credibly to the public. The uh, <coughs> thing with documentation, in some way, one of the most interesting features of this film was all those emails uh, as a way of carrying the narrative. Um, were they actual emails that you were photographing or were you reproducing them for the purpose of the film? Um, sure, so one of the things we were most interested in covering because we wanted the FBI's voice in this movie. Like literally we were trying to ride around with them in the field in Pittsburgh, get them going to, the, they weren't having it. And so the closest we had journalistically was Saeed's cell phone, right? Um, and once we got to Khalifa was Khalifa's cell phone. So something that Saeed would do regularly, he had a smartphone, you know, smartphones keep all of the text message records. So he would be texting during the day with Khalifa, but then he would forward some of those texts to the FBI. And it was very interesting to us which correspondences over the course of a day he would forward, right? Because it'd be like when Khalifa was in a bad mood or sort of, leave me alone, brother, you know, that he would forward that to the FBI versus like, good morning. You know, so it was very interesting. But to your point, we, we got toward the end of the film and realized that the FBI would not give us comment. And we realized that both of these individuals had smartphones. And so literally the whole record of the investigation, well, I can't say the whole record, because Saeed's phone was more complete than Khalifa, because Khalifa got a little paranoid at one point and just started deleting things, like that would help. Um, but, so we had, we had the cell phone record, so all of the text messages that you see, um, our lawyers advised us not to put the date and time, um, that our lawyers advised us not to put the numbers from the actual FBI agents, but aside from those three things, those are pretty much accurate text message exchanges throughout the course of the investigation. Mm -hmm. The thing that really, aside from the all of the civil liberties issues and federal government issues, the, the incredible banality of these lives is like one long headache. I mean, nothing, I mean, the big excitement is they go to McDonald's and a couple of coffee. But, I mean, and it's right, but two, I l actually, the McDonald's scene I think is very indicative of the problem that sort of the FBI faces. Because if you, look, if you were to look at Khalifa's Facebook profile in and of itself, you know, he posted Osama bin Laden reading the Quran. There's a lot of people that read the Quran. He posted the Taliban. Um, his, his little line above it was the Taliban are the perfect wearers of the turban. Um, and I think, you know, if you were to look at his page, arguably, that is somebody that you should maybe look at, right? Because also I think McDonald's is indicative as a scene because when Khalifa's prayer alarm went off on his cell phone, sort of the, the guy goes, Taliban, and Khalifa's instant response, Taliban, what does that mean, brother? I don't know. It means student. Ain't nothing wrong with them, brother. If you listen, that's what, he, that's what his response was about the Taliban. Ain't nothing wrong with them, brother. Listen, in 2013, well established what the Taliban has done. You know, so this is sort of the issue that the FBI faces. Like this is First Amendment protected speech for you to say these things. The Taliban is the perfect, are the perfect wearers of the turban. There's nothing wrong with them, brother. But if that's overheard out of context, you know, it's just an open question. What is the sort of the FBI to do? And I think that's actually, especially since now the Islamic State is primarily communicating via, via social media and that's its, its recruitment tool. You know, social media is being very, very scrutinized. Even emoticons now are getting people arrested. So it's just, uh, we live in an interesting time. But I think that McDonald scene is very honest of who Khalifa was. Because if you put a smiley face in a gun and you're a high school student, you're going to jail. You're being suspected of a school shooter. It's happened, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, agreed, agreed, agreed. If you think about um, the fact that Oh man, I'm forgetting his name. The, the clockmaker, um, the kid that left the United States and went to Qatar. Yes, Ahmed Mohammed. Thank you. You know who, who was arrested in his middle school for making a clock? Ultimately made it to the White House, but you know, these things are happening all the time. Yeah, depending on your.